Serverless Amazons. This time we are having two guests. We are having a man and a wonderful lady. Hello, Richard to California and hello, Michelle in Florida. Good morning. Oh, good morning to you. It's evening for me and very early morning. Right. I would say <laughs> thank you for joining me and thank you for agreeing to this uh, friendly chat. I don't like to call it podcast. It is kind of a chat between friends, people who share common interests and who could inspire other people. So uh, let's start first with Michelle. I usually ask my guests about their childhood growing up. Did you grow up in Florida? How was I, What was I, I, did. I was born in Florida uh, to, in a large family. I was the fourth of six children. Um, I had kind of a country, small town upbringing, and um, I didn't realize it until looking back on it retrospectively, but um, ate very much like my grandparents and great grandparents and great grand grandparents always had. We had a garden. Um, my family hunted, so we ate wild game and raised rabbits. And um, so there wasn't in my small town, we didn't even have a traffic light or a grocery store. So there was no processed food. And we were very healthy growing up, never ill. Um, everyone was, was healthy. And um, looking back on it, I can appreciate having that beginning. And it wasn't until after I went to college that I really started to have issues with my weight and my health. Oh, that's, that's very interesting because I was expecting you're going to have a, a growing up with unhealthy way of living and then suddenly discover. So it was a, like a zigzag. How about you, Richard? I know your origin is Hungarian, but Californian way of growing up and doing life uh, by the ocean, it's uh, similar, I would say, when it comes to climate, but some things are different. Yeah, it's California. Yeah, it's a, a Mediterranean climate. Um, we have a little bit more uh, dry, arid, uh humidity so it's it's different probably than florida i think um I, we could always use a little bit more humidity here um, on occasion we do have some what we call uh, monsoon conditions in the late summer but uh climate wise we are mostly sunny um we do get rain but it's very heavy and very few and far between so it'd be nicer to have, you know, sprinkling more consistently, but uh, it is what it is. I actually appreciate having that much sun. It's, it's, it's been great growing up here, uh, traveling to the Mediterranean really reminded me of home, but at the same time, coming back home, now it reminds me of the Mediterranean. I, it's one of my favorite places in the world. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. What about the diet? Did you okay. grow up on standard American diet? I did not. Uh, uh, obviously, my family's Hungarian, um, uh, specifically Transylvanian origin. Um, the food style is is relatively traditional. Um, it's a cross, actually, between traditional European, which is um there's a lot of french influence and mediterranean influence so it's kind of a hybrid of both so growing up that's kind of what i was exposed to i uh i don't think my parents or grandparents ever uh i mean we always ate what they cooked uh fast food was just becoming more uh ex i guess more popular as I was a, an older child. It really didn't exist much prior to that. Um, I grew up in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. So we just, we didn't have those, those options. Um, processed food was probably uh, starting to become uh, available, but we weren't exposed to that either. We, they had breakfast cereals uh very sugary breakfast cereals my mom would never allow us to have that 
uh, sugary uh, stuff, <laughs> uh, unless we were on a, a, a family trip or something special, but on a regular basis, it was always cooked until I would say the eighties, that's where it changed. Mm -hmm. And it kind of changed for well, me as well. Michelle, was it the same for you in the eighties? Did you feel this change? Yes, actually I started college in 1975. So graduated high school and began college in 1975. And coming from the small town that I did, I never had access to that kind of fast food. Twice a year, we would make a 60 mile trip to the dentist and afterwards we would get Burger King or, or some fast food. And that was really the limit of our exposure to that type of food. And then I moved into a dormitory and there was a cafeteria and it was kind of unlimited food and lots of, you know, starchy comfort foods. And um, so that really began my weight gain and my kind of downhill slide um, in my health. And as well as um, back in those days, a long time ago, uh, you could drink at 18. So I was drinking alcohol for the first time, which of course we know blocks glucagon. So it, it makes uh, fat loss really a, a dead end and um just uh, excess of food and types of food i had never eaten before as well as drinking and that really was the beginning of my weight gain when i went to college oh i i kind of fell in the same same boat uh my my metabolic health my weight gain my inflammation started very strongly in college when i started um i'm sure my metabolism played a role and i used to swim in high school uh, five hours a day, kind of broken up throughout the day. And in college, I, I stayed in, in the, in the sport, but more as a coach. So of course I'm not, you know, burning the calories that I did and, uh, the exposure to processed foods as, as you alcohol, I, I never really was, uh, that big of a drinker, uh, you know, in, our household, it wasn't really restricted, limited. There was no stigma. It's like, it's there, it's boring. So it, luckily it didn't influence me as much, but it was there. Uh, my peers were very uh, intrigued by it. And, uh, you know, that exposure was uh, uh, there, but very limited for me. It was, it was processed foods. I guess I was craving in my philosophy, energy. So, uh, you know, the combination of horrendous inflammatory fats with sugar. So, you know, manufactured pies, desserts, it's the worst combo. And it, it truly, uh, affected me as, as it did Michelle in, in right about the beginning of college. That's I think that's a natural time for your metabolism to kind of move into a new phase in any case. And then when you compound that with a change, a significant change in diet, like we experienced when we went to college, it sort of sets the stage and, and lays the foundation for um, really big metabolic changes. And I, I believe from when I started college at 17 um, until I graduated and was married and had my first son at age 25, uh, my weight increased about uh, 35 pounds. So that's a big change. And, and I suspect at that point, I was probably pre-diabetic because I developed gestational diabetes, um, gained a lot of weight, very hypertensive, had to have a C-section. And so I really do mark that as the beginning of, you know, my metabolic decline. And um, from that point onward, it was really a struggle until um, I was officially diagnosed with diabetes and, and my hypertension was really severe. Um, and then I found um, a miracle at the age of 53. I'm 64 now, I'll be 65 in June. And um, just found a physician who had gone through the same thing herself and uh, gotten her master's in nutrition and understood what it was that I needed and completely reversed everything in um, hypertension in three weeks and my diabetes in three months. Wow. wow. Congratulations. Congratulations, yeah. really interesting. What actually- You saved my life. I'm, I'm convinced I would have had a stroke or, or a heart attack in those ensuing 12 years had, had I not 
had my condition um, really treated by someone who understood what was going on. Yes, it pushed you also to uh, to a further level of education. Uh, mm -hmm. You, uh, besides a bachelor in health science, you also mm -hmm. continued with the nutrition science, with a master in nutrition, and now you're teaching at several universities. Tell us. Yes, about I. Teach. I'm sorry. Tell us a little bit about that experience, sharing your knowledge and. I'm really amazed in our universities over here in Europe, nobody would be able to teach anything about low carb, not to mention mm -hmm. keto. And you are actually teaching keto cooking and keto, well, the science behind how keto works for people. And the, there is one connection here, which I noticed all of us, it's back to the home cooking. It's like the answer lays back with, with parents, grandparents and the way they lived. It's, it, there's a connection there. So if you can tell us a little bit about your students and how do you approach them? What are the so most interesting questions you will receive from them? Well, it's kind of been an evolution. Um, I began first began teaching college um, almost five years ago. And um, at that time was teaching for a nursing school originally and had to teach the strict dietary guidelines, all of the things that the nursing students would be tested on uh, for their NCLEX, which um, unfortunately and sadly even today is the um, dietary guidelines and the um, typical standard of care that cholesterol is terrible and fat makes you fat. And um, if you're diabetic, you can eat as many carbs as you want, just take more medicine. Um, and so for that first year, I really struggled um, and would would more or less just verbally present to them, this is what the textbook says, this is what the guidelines are, but let me tell you about my own story. And so through sharing that story, I would get lots of questions. Um, Gosh, my mom's diabetic. I'm afraid I'm going to be diabetic. How do I keep from doing that? How can I help her? And so we were just able to um, anecdotally and in conversation um, expose them to kind of the paradigm of, of this uh, standard guidelines on um, obesity and diabetes and heart disease and hypertension. Um, and I was able, I had some leeway, uh, the dean of the college who hired me um, gave me leeway to uh, really rewrite the course. And over the course of several years, then I started incorporating in more discussions, um, having them compare and contrast. So the paradigm of the traditional uh, dietary guidelines and approach to metabolic disease that was not helping, that was not decreasing obesity, that was not improving rates of diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. And contrast that with um, presentations from um, Dr. Sarah Helberg and Dr. Jason Fung and Dr. Andy Fung and Dr. Eric Westman and uh, Dr. Zoe Harcum and uh, Dr. Ted Naiman and on and on and on, just the list and the wealth of information that I could expose these students to, to get them to begin to question um, if the status quo is not working, why, metabolically why, and we would go into the biochemistry of that, um, Dr. Uh, um, Bickman, Ben Bickman um, has some wonderful videos on uh, the uh, hormonal um, impact of the differing macronutrients. And so now that I've been able to rewrite the course and for my other two colleges, um, I was able to modify the course as well. Now I present the foundational science, biochemical science from a hormonal perspective and let them draw their own conclusions. Well, the guidelines say we should eat 65% carbs, but I know if I do that, I'm keeping my insulin high 24 hours a day and I won't ever burn my, my stored energy, my stored fat. And so students are bright and perceptive and they come to these conclusions and these realizations on their own. And so I don't have to really promote a biased point of view when I present all the science, which is what the guidelines do not. They don't they don't say why they, they have no justification for the uh, percent of their ratios. And in fact, uh, so Harcum does several excellent lectures about how the guidelines were derived. And there's really very little science behind it. And what science is behind it is um, 
of questionable value, should we say. So, um, so I'm really enjoying it. And I've had a number of students who over the course of a 16 week term have reported to me that they've lost 30 pounds, they're off their blood pressure medicine, they're, you know, consulting with their doctor, their doctor took them off of it. And um, they're beginning to understand that they have control of their own health and their own life. And to me, that's the greatest validation for what I do and motivation for what I do. Your uh, keto way of living, actually, you call it very low carbohydrate diet. This is what I uh, grabbed from your description. And it's interesting, just very low carbohydrate, and we can play with the fat and protein as long as we take enough of protein. We know it, that it's a protos, like we say in Greek, it's a primary nutrient. But uh, in uh, Florida, is it very difficult to find, let's say, pasture-raised eggs or uh, raw milk, for example, goat milk? which is very low. In raw, milk is, raw milk is a more difficult find, but uh, we're a huge agricultural state. Um, I don't know exactly where we rank, but we're in the top five in the nation for beef production, dairy production. Um, uh, we, we also produce a lot of eggs up in the, the panhandle. So um, now it's it's available and um, a lot of a lot more farmers now are farming, um, especially in Central and South Florida, um, goats and sheep and um, those type of proteins as well. But uh, yeah, I just I I realized going through the process of reversing my diabetes and, and during that 10 month period, um, I lost 85 pounds that I had to keep my protein at a certain level. And because I was a postmenopausal woman at that time, um, I can't do a traditional keto with a higher fat percentage. And that is true for a lot of women that are postmenopausal. Um, we need a lower fat uh, ratio in our, what I call very low carb. Um, but I do, because I was insulin resistant and diabetic for so long, I really think from the time I was 25 until uh, 53, when, when I finally found a physician to help, um, I have to keep my carbohydrates quite low. So 35 tops, 40 grams of carb a day. And so that means then, therefore, I've got to fill in my calories with um, protein and fat. And, and I try to limit it pretty much other than uh, cooking with ghee or butter um, or um, coconut oil um, and eating uh, eggs, the whole eggs. Um, I try to keep it to the whole fat that's in the whole fresh food. So the fat in the steak, I love ribeye, um, the fat that's in whatever cut of meat, the fat that's in the shrimp or or salmon or whatever fish that I'm cooking. How do you stay so youthful? I'm really impressed. Is it the beach life behind it? Is it the climate of California and uh, Richard in your case, but in uh, Michelle's case, uh, Florida? Because everybody in Europe, when we think of nice place in the United States, we think, we think of these two places. So what's the secret there or was keto the main uh, key? I, I believe in my case, it's absolutely diet um, because my, uh, my complexion, I, I have never had surgery or, or Botox or anything like that and 64 and a half. And I really believe it's the food and the nutrients. I think um, when I began to focus more on um, protein um, back 12 years ago, um, I feel like my connective tissue really began to repair itself. And as I lost those 85 pounds, I didn't have any sagging. Um, I didn't have any drooping uh, skin or anything. I was able to wear a bikini. And um, so I think that I think it's absolutely nutrition. And when you do focus on protein, a lot of those aging issues that we call aging are actually more about poor nutrition. And so I tell my students that all the time. I say, you know, aging and the, what we commonly incorrectly refer to as um, the diseases of old age are really just metabolic diseases. They're really just metabolic issues. And, and of course, exercise is part of that too. I do lift and I swim. And like Richard, um, I, I started swimming um, actually before I lost the weight, before I reversed my diabetes, I started, I was inspired by a book called Slow Fat Triathlete. 
and um, started training to um, do sprint triathlons and did those for a number of years before um, I actually lost the weight. Why I didn't have a heart attack, I'll never know. But thankfully, God was with me and, and, I, and I managed to just hang in there. And that may have actually kept me from having a more serious um, blood pressure problem before I was able to reverse my hypertension and diabetes. Um, but then and over the years, I've had a couple um, training accidents. And so now I just do the open water swim. And um, so I find that that uh, continuous exercise is so good for your joints and um, and connective tissue. I think when you exercise, all your connective tissue is rejuvenated, not just in your joints. Um, and so I think that makes a difference. Can you do it all year round in Florida? Yes, we can do it all. Now it's wetsuit weather right now. Our water was down to 64 this morning. So it's it's a wetsuit swim right now. But um, luckily in the Gulf, it's not going to get much below 62 even through the winter because we have so much sunshine. What so. about you, Richard? Do you? Yeah, well, I I totally have a swimming uh, Michelle, yeah. I you look amazing. It's I, I think age is a number for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the but as far as exercise and the weight of exercise to nutrition, don't forget sleep. Those three factors. I always illustrate that that yeah, nutrition's probably equally as important as sleep. Mm -hmm but more important than exercise, although exercise is a critical component. Um, so all three, it's a three-legged stool. They're all important, but I do agree with you. I put more weight in nutrition um, in terms of value, as far as the environment, you know, being in California and the sunshine, I had horrible metabolic disease. I had inflammatory disease and I lived here. I grew up here. So the, the environment didn't solve my problem. It was truly nutrition, uh, sleep, you know, that's a, that's a factor as well. Um, you know, in Western culture, a lot of us, depending on where you live, what you do overlook the value of recuperative, um, uh, behavior. Um, that's the approach I take with coaching. So swimming, in my opinion, is, is, is one of the better choices for a couple of reasons. What one you're using 80% of your body, uh, running, you're using maybe anywhere from 30 to 60% of your body, uh, resistance training, uh, kind of limits you to muscle conditioning, but not cardiovascular conditioning. Um, a lot of people overtrain, overtrain in cardiovascular, overtrain in resistance training. You want balance kind of like you do with the three-legged stool. You want balance with good nutrition, good um, recuperative sleep. And what goes with that is uh, lifestyle too friends, socializing, uh, in a healthy, positive manner, that that's a big part of it. Uh, swimming's great in that it does incorporate a larger perspective in, in terms of, uh, physical, um, training, uh, you, you, you have a, um, an ability to modulate how hard your resistance will be or how low it will be. I always start somebody slow. I make sure they don't go too fast. We have a tendency to do things a little harder going into it, no matter what the exercise is. You have to start extremely slow. Your body will tell you when you're ready. But I force people in swimming to, uh, to start slow also to improve their stroke. The slower you go, the more efficient your movements have to be in order to, to obtain that locomotion. So I, as a trainer, I, I focus on doing that periodically, even with advanced sw swimmers. Uh, it's hard to do. It's hard to swim slow. Um, it's easy to swim fast. It's hard to maintain it, but it's easy. It's hard to go slow. So uh, I, I look at that as as part of balance so you want to mix you know your your efforts so you've got a little bit of uh resistance training water is amazing for that you've got a little bit of conditioning uh 
how fast you go, how much you kick compared to how much your arms are utilized. Those all play a role and it's fun to play with. You can modulate and think about the feeling of what you're doing and uh, experiment. Everybody's also so different. We have different uh, 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 twitch levels, fast twitch, slow twitch. So uh, you kind of have to look at it individually. There's no one uh, style fits all, um, but swimming does fit all in general. You have the ability to do pretty much everything. Oh. Uh, I, so let me put it in perspective. I've taught infants, not toddlers, but infants, how to float and swim. And I used to coach a 104 year old lady. Um, I forgot her last name, but Dorothy was her name, 104. And she, uh, she knew how to swim. She's never done swimming as exercise and it totally changed her life. She never missed one training. She says it's invigorated me, it, uh, allowed her joints to loosen and open her muscles. In my opinion, muscle plays such a huge role in aging. Well, um, it's like one of the protein and muscle. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So uh, she gained muscle. She, uh, her, at, in those days, I, I didn't know what I know now uh, in nutrition. Um, however, in the training side, her inflammatory markers, arthritis, started to go away. Mm -hmm. um, she had more energy to, uh, she liked to tra travel and shop and she, she was so limited and she was able to start doing those elements. Um, I kind of lost touch with my group. I, I coached while I was a college student. So, uh, when I graduated, uh, I was one of those students, it was a commuter school. So you took classes progressively. And uh, I was an entrepreneur then. I had businesses, I coached, I, uh, I did a lot of things. So it took me about eight years to graduate. And uh, so I coached the whole time, but once I graduated, I moved. So I lost touch with everyone, but I'm sure she maintained that. But to answer your question, there's no limit in age, not one iota. Did you? I agree. It, it's such a great sport to begin at an older age because it is so gentle on um, your joints. And as, as Richard said, you can begin slowly. So um, I encourage people if they've never swam before, get a kickboard. You can buy one at any um, department store, um, Walmart or that type of store and um, just start kicking across the pool kick across back and forth across the pool and strengthen your legs and um, you know just start to do what you're able to do and um, it comes very quickly the muscle strength you know builds very quickly when you're swimming and I think because as Richard said the resistance is continuous and um, I, I was checking the masters um, 2.4 mile swim times this morning um, for the uh, the different age groups and they go up to 84. So um, there, there are people swimming competitively well up into their 80s and, and even longer. So um, it's just a great opportunity for people who um, either are insecure about going into a gym or some fitness facility to just go down to the nearest pool, your condo complex or your community pool um, and take a kickboard and just start kicking back and forth across the pool and and do it for the relaxation of it initially. And then as you build strength, you're gonna realize I can I can do more than I was doing. And, and it it kind of comes naturally. Absolutely. Is there Absolutely. Both of you could say to people with hydrophobia, you know, those fear of water. Do you guys have something, uh, have you ever had somebody with you uh, try to help to such a person? And if not, Maybe they will be watching this video. You never know who can be watching it. So maybe something you can tell them. Let's start with Michelle, who is, who used to do even competitive uh, uh, triathlon, or was I, did I catch? Yeah. And after that, recreational. 
Well, I've not taught swim lessons since I was in college, but did teach toddlers at the time. And um, as Richard said earlier, you have to teach them and you alluded to it as well. You've got to teach someone to float because I think the security comes in knowing that at any point you can just roll over on your back and float and, you know, kind of reorient yourself, rest or whatever, you know, you need to do to, to gain your confidence to continue. So I think a combination, if I had someone that was really phobic um, about the water, I would work with them um, on floating first until they were very secure and then encourage them to begin using a kickboard or some device to hold on to, to begin to kick out into deeper water and back so that they begin to just build a comfort level. Um, and I, that's going to vary for different people how long that process would take, I imagine. What about you, Richard? Do you ever deal with uh, people with hydrophobia? Oh, yeah, as a coach, uh, all the time. I had beginner swimmers that didn't know how to swim. Um, the phobia comes from a fear of control. And that control is based on a lack of being able to breathe. It's all about breathing. That's where the phobia comes into play. So I tell individuals that have that phobia, uh, if they have a bathtub or a hot tub where they are close to the bottom, very within control. So there is no fear. I have them practice holding their breath underwater. Mm -hmm. So very peacefully. And I, I try to utilize a meta meditation approach. So you relax, you think about waterfalls, dolphins, and uh, warmth, and hold your breath comfortably in on your terms, in within your control. Holding your breath is the key. Swimming's actually not a very difficult movement if you lose your phobia. You can get back to the top relatively easy. Uh, some people are very dense. The muscles are, are, are uh, predominant. There's less adipose or fat. Uh, so they may not float very easily. Um, that would be, you know, a, an example where, yeah, floating may not solve that problem holding their breath in a controlled environment first, and then being in a position where once you overcome the breath side, uh, even not in the water, sitting on the couch, hold your breath for a minute if you can, work your way up to a minute. Um, once you feel, yeah, I can hold my breath, I've got that control, then do it in a controlled water environment. Uh, the bathtub, a jacuzzi or hot tub, uh, then the shallow end of a pool. Um, practice, you can hold your nose if you want. Uh, just go underwater, 10 seconds, come back up. Go back under, 10 seconds, come back up. Uh, do, do it the next day for 20 seconds if you can. If you already know you can hold your breath for a minute, just progress. It's all about progression. And once you feel control of that breathing side, the phobia is, is eliminated really rapidly. Um, I had a, a person that wanted to do a triathlon that didn't know how to swim. I didn't know. Um, I, uh, I asked her to just show me her stroke and she got in, she tried to swim and she sunk. And luckily there, we had lane lines. So she grabbed the lane line and came back up. And uh, her name was Alida, and she's from Romania. So oh. she, uh, I asked her, I said, do you know how to swim? She says, no. So, okay, no big deal at all. So no big deal. We're going to get you swimming a triathlon in probably less than six months. So I brought her to the shallow side and that those were the exercises we started with the breath holding. So I had her go in the shallow end, holding onto the wall and just dunk her head underwater and come back up for a specific amount of time. And we worked on that within six months, she swam a triathlon successfully six months, not knowing how to swim to, uh, actually it was a short course triathlon and, uh, yeah, it, it's doable for anyone, but it's the phobia is based on breathing fear, fear of lack of control. When you say fasted, uh, how many hours after waking up you are swimming and do you take anything? I used to take salty water before swimming. 
Um, typically, no. I do magnesium glycinate, 800 milligrams of magnesium glycinate at least twice a day. Um, and that's really the only thing I'll have in the morning before I swim. So I might swim. It really depends on my lecture schedule. But um, and if it's, you know, windy or I try and get out earlier because the winds will blow and, and the water will get choppy in the Gulf later in the afternoon. So typically, if I've eaten dinner between five and six and I'm out um, by 10 or 11 in the morning, it's working on 18 hours um, fasted with just water. Um, I don't really use electrolytes. I will do a little um, potassium um, powder in, in some water um, if I know that I have been, uh, when your insulin is low, you need more sodium and potassium really to keep that intracellular, extracellular balance. And um, if you're not eating a lot of vegetables, then you're really getting neither one of those except what salt you add to your food. And so you need to balance that with some potassium. So um, I don't drink sports drinks or, or um, take electrolytes or anything like that and haven't really found that I needed anything other than I do need the magnesium. If I slack off on that at all, um, usually after a mile and a half, I'll, I'll start to get cramps in my feet. Never in my legs, just for some reason in my feet. But. In general, I'm not a very friend of supplements. This is what Richard knows. A couple of days ago, Michelle, maybe you noticed this on Twitter. I posted, type uh, American keto in Google and see what you're going to get. And then type Greek keto. I put Greek. I could put whatever country, but I put Greek just to see. So when, when you type American keto, you just get exogenous ketones and all the other supplements. It's like nothing else, just supplements, 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 supplements. And when you uh, type Greek keto, you just get some salad with a lot of chicken, which is again, not Greek keto, but <laughs> food. it's a real food. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys fight against this? I mean, when does, what, it's easier in America, I guess, than it is here, but how do you uh, approach those people who tell you that it's super unhealthy or it's, uh, what are you saying? It's going to destroy you. Any of you? I, I use um, a couple lectures by Lily Nichols. Mm -hmm. um, she is a specialist in gestational diabetes, and um, she has a couple great lectures on YouTube. And actually, what's interesting when you study anthropological nutrition is our natural state. Um, and Dr. Ben Bigman talks about this as well, is to be what I call metabolically fluid. So mm -hmm. if you think of our um, paleo ancestors, it, the normal dietary pattern would be to not eat every day, um, maybe every few days. If you think of a community of nomadic people that were following a herd, um, it might take them several days to track and make a kill and provide food for the community. Um, and so during that time, they would be in a state of ketosis and would go very quickly into ketosis because they weren't they weren't eating a lot of out of season, um, non-local carbohydrates that would have made them insulin resistant. So they were very fluid. And we're uh, today when we treat someone and in my own case, um, to reverse insulin resistance, it took me almost five days to get into a state of metabolic ketosis so that I could begin to burn my stored fat. My insulin had to drop low enough. My insulin resistance had to reverse to the degree that I could then begin to produce glucagon and access my stored fat for energy for those fatty acids. Um, but in our ancestral, in anthropology, that could occur in a matter of a few hours. And in fact, Lily Nichols talks in her lectures about how a fetus is in ketosis, uh, metabolic ketosis, about 30% of the time. And a newborn infant is born in metabolic ketosis. And as they are provided um, a normal diet, which would be mother's milk, depending on the amount of carb and protein in the feeding and the interval in between feedings, they can go into metabolic ketosis in as little as 30 minutes. So when their body and their brain signals that they need more energy, they just switch into metabolic ketosis. And so that flexibility and that fluidity is a natural part of our biology, but we, we have destroyed it with processed food so that the average person who wants to go on a keto diet has to do an induction phase of sometimes as such as 
my case, up to four to five days before their body will convert over and begin to do what it naturally would do in our, if we were following our ancestral dietary patterns of um, not eating typically one or maybe two meals a day. Um, if you think of no refrigeration, no food storage, no preservation, um, very little opportunity maybe even to build a fire and cook food, um, and then just accessing the food, um, plant material only available at certain times of the year and only what was local endemic to that area. Um, so if we look back at our anthropology, at our ancestry, um, the way that we eat today is so disordered. It's completely disordered from our biology. And if we can reconnect to our biology, which is fresh, local, whole food, only in season, um, you know, people would only eat the fruits and vegetables that grew in their geographic area and only at certain times of the year. And then they weren't available the rest of the year. So then you were eating fish that you could that could that you could catch or shellfish or um, whatever other proteins eggs and and whatever other meats you were able to um, acquire um, and that's a natural way of eating so people try to um, such as as your husband's um, professor say that uh, a keto way of eating is not normal or it's disordered actually the way we eat today three meals and snacks and processed food is is the disordered way of eating and um, eating natural ancestral foods is what our biology is based on and when we richard mentioned uh ruminant meats and uh, ruminants concentrate the micronutrients and so ruminant foods um, and eggs as well um, are the most nutrient dense because that's their job. They they take all of the micronutrients in the uh, the grass and the plants that they eat and they concentrate them in their tissue. So um, Dr. Naaman uh, does a lecture, Ted Naaman does a lecture in his PDE um, talk and he talks about how free feeding animals will eat until they have satisfied their protein needs. And ah. so protein is the limiting mac macronutrient in terms of satiety. Um, and so protein is going to um, trigger your PYY and your satiety hormones and um, fat will to a degree, but carbs never do. And so um, animals who have their protein limited below 15% will overeat energy by 30%. And so our sadly, our dietary guidelines, the only macronutrient guideline that they changed in 2020 was to lower the protein percentage from 12% to 10%, which is horrific because that guarantees if you're only feeding someone 10% protein, they're going to overeat. They're going to overeat energy because the brain knows it needs more protein. So what does it do? It tells you keep eating. I still need protein. Don't stop yet. And so protein really is, in terms of satiety, is the limiting macronutrient. And, and that's why when you focus on protein first, you get nutrient density in micronutrients, and then you also reach satiety much faster, especially if it includes, you know, if it's a whole fresh protein that includes the fat that's naturally with it. That's awesome. That's awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. As, and to kind of go with that, uh, that thought, um, supplements. So, uh, you mentioned magnesium glycinate. I, I, uh, I have supplemented with magnesium glycinate. Uh, typically I take it at I took it at night because it, it calms and it, it creates a deeper sleep, but Roberta taught us via, uh, Apollonis, the, the aspect of nutrient bioavailability. So most supplements are not bioavailable at all or very little. Mm -hmm. So as an alternative, bone broth, ruminant bone broth, bone broth has so much magnesium. Um, so I've shifted, I've shifted to uh, suppl supplementing with the natural food, just as you mentioned, when you eat your fats, you eat fats from the meat itself, not as an added element. Same with nutrients. Um, I'll, I'll try to obtain, you know, the knowledge of 
okay, which nutrients am I trying to go, go for? So the magnesium aspect, you think about it, same, same thing, a ruminant concentrates those nutrients. The magnesium is, is, you know, from the produce of what they're eating, I guess we call it produce, but it's, you know, grass it's, you know, there's so much energy in that grass from this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, photosynthesis. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the supplements of vitamin C, for example, C buckthorn is an amazing, uh, uh is it a berry? Uh, I guess it's it is. It's um, healthiest berry in the universe. When I yeah. started studying, I don't know, Michelle, have you heard about it? I've heard of it. Yes. I've never, I've never taken that. Oh, uh, Richard can tell you where he. Yeah, so see, uh, buckthorn is it, uh, it's usually a puree. It, you if you purchase it, it's made into a puree. I, it, I think it grows in northern hemisphere more so than it would southern. So it's hard for us, you know, uh, uh, closer to the equator, I guess. Yeah. To so to finish, could you give uh, just like a a tip? to people who are just starting and those who often start and go off. You know, those people who just can't steady, stay steady at least for a couple of months on a, on a very low carbohydrate diet, KMD or any keto or low carb diet. So let's start with Richard and Michelle, maybe can finish. I, well, I always tell people, um, just eat the least processed foods possible. Meaning, I think we talk about it, and you know, uh, amongst ourselves uh, through our KMD uh, friends, um, if it has a barcode, it shouldn't have more than three ingredients, maybe uh, one ideally. So I give that advice. Uh, the second is um, stay away from processed industrial oil. You stay away from that. You're going to get the most bang for for your buck. I think heart disease probably uh, became most prevalent uh, after the industrial revolution, where they they utilized these machine oils and said, "Hey, we it's easy to produce. Let's turn it into food." And that's where heart disease started to uh, escalate. Um, so I I say stay away from inflammatory fats. Uh, that includes pork. Well, I would say, first of all, it's never too late. Um, I was postmenopausal in my 50s when I realized I had to take control and do something and save my life and was uh, very, very fortunate to find a physician who had the same approach. Um, so it's never too late to regain your health. You can do it if you're in your 50s, your 60s. I think um, Dr. Westman even said the oldest patient he's had to reverse their diabetes was um, in their early 80s. So it's never too late. You can regain your health. And as far as exercise, um, you're never too old to exercise. Learn a new sport, learn a new activity, or just start walking. And if you miss a day or you fall off the wagon for a few weeks or a few months, just start again. You know, today's a new day and um, you can only change what's in the future to come. And um, it's very powerful to know that you have control of your health and your body and your life and your future. And um, aging should be about having choices, um, how to live your life and what, what you choose to do with it rather than um, what you're only able to do because of illness. And so um, take your life back, take control, take charge, do all the things that Richard uh, mentioned and that we've talked about in terms of diet, um, eat whole real food, and um, eat as close as you can to the way your ancestors ate, and um, you'll see the difference. You'll see results, the same like Michelle and Richard and I also had. Thank you very much, both of you. I'm really hoping very soon to continue this conversation, maybe to take it to another uh, di direction, but you have been so inspiring and I just don't have anything else to say except Thank you, guys. You're very welcome. Thank you. It was an honor, always.